Welcome to The Violin Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Progala, where I interview violinists from around the world. If you're new to the podcast, it would mean the world if you could subscribe. And we also want to thank you for joining us today. My guest today is a recent Concert Artist Guild Ambassador Prize winner for 2020. She's a violinist, composer, activist, and the founding director of The Heartbeat Project. Please let me welcome Ariel Horowitz. Ariel, so nice to meet you. Again, congrats on your recent success on the Concert Artist Guild. I'm so looking forward to talking to you. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. How are you? You know, I'm okay. Right now, we're we're recording this episode on Halloween. Yes. So, so it's pretty pretty darn cool that we're doing that. It's the first violin podcast Halloween episode, so that's kind of cool. Um, but I'm not so um, happy about the snow that happened yesterday in New England the day before. And I know we, before we before we started rolling on the podcast, you know, we started talking about like we were not prepared for this snow. <laughs> No, literally not. Like I was so not prepared. I still had my window AC unit in and like I could just feel the like snow flakes drifting through the cracks of my window. And yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Today and yesterday. Right. Yeah. And um, actually, you know, we're, we'll talk about this in the podcast, but we're actually not too far away from each other because you're actually a faculty on at, at Mount Holyoke which is a uh, college in Western Massachusetts. So I definitely kind of want to pick your brain on um, how you teach your students, especially at the collegiate level. Totally. But first, yeah. yeah, but first let's get to know you, okay? Who is Ariel Horowitz? Like, give us, give us like a, a rundown of who she is and you know, what, what, your, what your goals are with the violin in general. Totally. Um, wow, okay, who am I? Gosh. Still trying to figure that out. No, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> yeah, aren't um, we all? I mean, come yeah. on. <laughs> oh my gosh, lifelong, lifelong process to figure oneself out. Um, yeah, so I was born in Washington, D.C., and I was raised in the Midwest between Ohio and Indiana. Um, so it was uh, kind of interesting growing up, you know, in that in that region of the country. Um, I have I come from a very like non traditional family format in like, you know, how we in America generally think about like, you know, families and, and the nuclear family unit. Um, I have two moms. They're actually both named Amy, um, which is hilarious. And, and everyone always uh, gets a good chuckle out of that, as do as do we all. Um, and yeah, our our family is just, you know, a little a little bit different. Um, I started playing the violin when I was four. And I loved it immediately. It was totally my choice. Like my parents are, um, they're like academics, activists, like they like folk music. Like they were some of the original, um, like, you know, gay rights protesters in the seventies, like especially uh, my, my biological mom um, just was such an incredible activist herself. And like, made so many waves back in the day back when like protesting you know really got its more modern um revitalization if you will and yeah they were like why do you want to play the violin that's so random um like i mean cool but you know but it was it was not you know so many musicians come from musical families and like i my family's interested in music but not in classical music so it was um super random, but I loved it right away. And I, you know, as I was growing up, I quickly realized that like, you know, there's a, a vibe in classical music that's very serious, very like, you know, classy, if you will, <laughs> in both kind of positive and negative ways. Um, and as I got to college, I went to Juilliard for my undergrad, which was amazing. It was an incredible experience. Um, I got to study with the legendary violinist Itzhak Perlman, which was completely insane. Um, so, so random and wonderful and um, life altering in, in so many ways. And I realized like, you know, I love playing the violin, but one of the most important things for me was to contribute to like a more positive and a more um, diverse and a more accessible and less elitist classical music culture. So um, that's my main mission that's kind of a through current in everything I do um, because you know our art form is so special but a lot of the baggage that comes with it is um, a little bit exclusionary sometimes so that's my vibe yeah that's awesome right well you special you you talk about less elitist and I definitely want to touch on that later on but 
So you are the founding director of the Heartbeat Project, and you know a lot of uh, from what I read about you, you are again like as you say, you are really trying to dwell like the music into the activism and to the protesting. So can you talk a little bit about that? As right now we're in a very as of this moment, you know when this podcast will be released, it'll be after the U.S. election. So things at the moment are. Kind of tense. So, yeah. how are you making sense of trying to add music into this activism role that you're playing with the Heartbeat Project? Yeah, it's complicated. I mean, you know, it's um, I I came into my role with the Heartbeat Music Project kind of you know not not intentionally. I at the time I was I was in college and I was you know really just trying to focus on practicing and I always knew in my heart that someday I would want to um, you know have some sort of project that would work to you know remove the barriers of access to classical music that you know so many of us who don't grow up incredibly wealthy with unlimited resources experience um, and you know again I'm speaking from a place of, of a lot of privilege myself like I, I had a family who um, was able to, you know, come up with the resources to support my music education. That's not always the case. So I knew that that was in my future. I just didn't think it would start while I was in college. Um, my mom was working as a curriculum consultant at Navajo Technical University, which is one of the largest tribal colleges on the Navajo Nation. Um, and she was in a conversation with some colleagues out there. And they were talking about how great it would be to have some type of performing arts program for, for their young kids. Um, and my mom, this, she's so cute. She's like my biggest fan. She's like, my daughter goes to Juilliard. Like, she'll do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's so cute. She calls me. She's like, hey, Ariel, like, what's up? Like, what are you doing this summer? And I was like, well, I, I don't know yet. I just got rejected from a bunch of festivals. <laughs> um, and she was like, do you want to come to the Navajo Nation and start a music program? And I was like, absolutely. Like, that sounds incredible. What an opportunity. What a, what a chance to get to, you know, like, um, commit to this vision of, of sharing music with people. And, and it, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's become the most important thing in my life. Um, by by a long stretch, it's it's so um, it's incredibly nuanced work to be a white person in this position, um, you know, in an indigenous space. And I I definitely don't always get it right. I'm surrounded by incredible colleagues who um, you know are are very very generous and very patient with me as you know I grapple with my own um, internalized white privilege and all of that stuff in this role. And um, you know. Uh, it's it's been it's been an incredible experience, and I feel really grateful that these families trust me with their children, and and that this community trusts me to, you know, um, like share music all together. I don't I don't like the idea that like I'm bringing music because in in Navajo Dene culture, music is already such a a central um, focus point. So it's just really it's more of a collaboration. It's more that we share music. Uh, we don't just focus on classical music. We do so many different genres. Um, very, yeah, so it's it's been you know it's and during this time it's been complicated. A lot of a lot of my students don't have um, internet access, so you know we're we're kind of uh, in a little bit of a lull in terms of programming and you know getting together and just jamming. So um, it's it's challenging, but it's incredibly rewarding, and I've learned a lot. I'm right there with you. I work for a um, for a nonprofit organization called Music of Franklin, which is out in Western Mass. Uh, you may or may have not, not heard of it, yeah, but um, they're based in the Turner's Falls and Greenfield, and they're, a lot of their work is transforming lives through music because they do also come from not elite families, and statistically speaking, you know, Franklin County, Massachusetts, at least, is you know not not the wealthiest county in the state, at least. So, you know, our job and my job as a lead teacher is to kind of um, work with the systemic racism that is like at this, in these communities and try to give every single child an opportunity to play an instrument, to experience music. And um, what, what I really did appreciate what you said is that you're not bringing this, uh, you're not bringing your music to the Navajo Nation because that's also like another form of, you know, like systemic racism and also um, like this white privilege, right? Because like, oh, I'm going to bring my music, which is superior to yours. And we don't want that, of course. Yeah, that's right? 
attitude, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so talk to me about some of the music that you do play with the Navajo Nation, because I'm not really too familiar with that kind of music. So what is what has it been like learning from your colleagues and learning how to ad- in- incorporate that into your curriculum at this project? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's been it's been an evolving process for sure. Um, you know, there's there's been times when um, I've had uh, you know not indigenous colleagues ask me why like I don't you know pull a bar talk and like go um, transcribe a bunch of like traditional music and I'm like that's not what that's not what it's about. Yeah, that's- coming from like an ethnomusicologist standpoint, yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, you know, there are there are musics that belong to um, the Diné people that are just not for me to hear or play. Um, they are sacred and special and um, don't don't belong to me. Um, and you know, in in that capacity, I have absolutely no right to you know teach that music. Um, so you know, what what I've tried to do over the years is. Um, teach a lot of music with my students um, by, you know, uh, Diné composers who were trained uh, classically. So that's kind of how I've been able to get in. And one such composer is um, this incredible composer, Raven Chacon. Um, His music is so innovative. I've never heard a composer play with the concept of sound the way that he does. Um, You know, like it's, um, he gets every instrument to like almost, not sound like what you would associate that instrument sounds like. And actually, um, I was working with a six-year-old uh, a couple years ago when I when I first discovered uh, Raven Jacone's music. And I, you know, we were just like learning how to hold the bow and you know, very very basic stuff. But I could tell she was getting a little antsy. So I was like, why don't we take a listening break and listen to this piece by Raven Chacone? Um And she was just completely transfixed. And uh, this piece is called, I'm gonna totally butcher the pronunciation. So all of my Diné colleagues, I am so sorry. um, Lats Ada, and it's a piece for solo violin. And she was like, oh my gosh, that sounds like the wind outside of my grandma's Hogan near Shiprock. And I like, you know, it's so amazing how kids um, gravitate towards things that are, you know, really, really profound in in ways that we as adults can't always um so i've since learned that piece and played it uh, and i had the privilege this summer to play it for raven chacon and like her interpretation of that piece has stuck with me forever you know and um i i'm so fortunate you know that that there are there are these musical traditions that are um are so special and and so meaningful. And you know, I have incredible colleagues at Heartbeat, um, incredible Diné musicians who um, you know have have done transformative work. I'm I'm currently working with uh, this really incredible pianist and ethnomusicologist, Diné pianist and ethnomusicologist named Renata Yazi, and she has um, this really awesome scholarship program that she started to help um, Indigenous. Uh, music students at the collegiate level get funded to, to study. Um, so we're, we're hosting a concert. Um, it's, it's all indigenous performers um, playing both indigenous music and Western classical music. And uh, that'll be on November 7th, which has been, it's been amazing to, to get to work with her and to, I mean, she's so talented and intelligent and brilliant. And um, she's just really curating a fabulous concert. So it's um, a lot of my role is getting out of the way I think, you know, it's it's my job to fundraise and to, you know, provide uh, the the means for a lot of this to happen in, in certain capacities. But but, you know, once it really comes down to it, I, I really try to step back and just, um, you know, and you kind of let them do their thing. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I know that a lot of it's like facilitation, like providing resources and as many resources for these kids as possible. So I really love what, what you're doing. I do want to point out a specific problem that you've encountered, which our organization has also encountered, and that is the access to internet. Because that has been one of the primary factors of this conversation of systemic racism in our society, at least. And I think as it's clear to me, especially that this topic has, you know, become really popular to talk about because it needs to be talked about in the music world, especially in the Western classical music world. So 
I'm curious to know for anyone who's listening to, um, I'm curious for anyone who's like wanting to know what kind of solutions you've provided for these students with the lack of internet. Cause I know that I were trying to create like these programs as right now we're in a digital world, but a lot of these kids don't even have access to Chromebooks. You know, these, these Chromebooks are back ordered until February of next year. And that's probably the next time they're going to see them. So I'm curious to know what you've been doing um, with the music education part, like how you've been giving this music education to these students. Yeah, it's been hard. I mean, I, I definitely, I don't want to sugarcoat it. And yeah, even, uh, even for us too, like and this is just an honest yeah. conversation. Cause like, it's been really difficult to um, provide the in-person in a safe manner. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to know what you, what you've been up to with that. Uh, I mean, I, I certainly don't want to, you know, present what we're doing at, at Heartbeat Music Project as like, you know, the grand success story of like, oh, we made it happen in spite of uh, internet access. Like the, the truth is, is that we've, we've really struggled. We operate on a shoestring budget. Um, and, you know, if I could personally buy every student of ours who doesn't have internet access, a Chromebook or a tablet or, or something, um, we would have been able to have our summer session this past summer. And, and unfortunately, that's just not a reality. Exactly like you pointed out, there are systemic issues um, due to the, you know, centuries long genocide of indigenous people and the systemic racism that persists, you know, in its wake. And, and it's, um, it's really hard. Um, what we have done is we, we have a number of students who actually do have internet access who are able to take online lessons and continue their studies throughout the year. Um, it's not lost on me that, that the children who do choose to pursue year-round lessons, and of course this is something that we offer to, to all of our students, um, it's not lost on me that the, the students who do pursue that um, generally generally have a little bit more um, access to things like, you know, internet or, you know, parent support to help them practice and things like that. Um, right now, we have basically shifted our focus to addressing the, the dire needs of the Navajo Nation during the pandemic. At, at a certain point in the summer, the, the COVID-related deaths per capita were higher than New York and New Jersey, which is just an absolutely staggering statistic. Um, and I'm, yeah. I'm very happy to say that to date, we have been able to raise close to $8,000 organizationally for COVID relief efforts on the Navajo Nation. And part of that has been, you know, we, we, um, we did a virtual benefit concert on um, August 22nd that featured a couple of our students who were able to record some videos and participate. A lot of our teachers, um, which was really special, you know, to even just a kind of reduced community event for us at HMP, um, come together and make music and, you know, really uh, bring the community together to uplift the Navajo Nation, which has, uh, received uh, not nearly enough federal support during this time. It's, it's been really devastating, but yeah, it's hard. It's, it's hard. hard. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I've, I've been really thinking about a lot of, you know, just generally speaking about the, the arts education and arts funding in this country. I, I learned just the other day by just by doing a little bit of research that the, the national endowment of the arts is the funding is 0.001% of the actual federal budget. Can you imagine yep. that? You know, and even though it's still in the millions, but imagine if that was like up, you know, 0.02%, then you have 0.03%. And that, that may sound silly, but if, if we have that much more funding to our arts and to our music and to our communities, you know, I think at this point in time, it's clear to say that even though the, the sciences and the mathematics and the literal, um, the liberal arts are important, but I think coming out of this, I think we're going to need a lot of music and we're going to need a lot of funding for creating opportunities for not only for teachers like you and myself and performers, but also for these kids who need an outlet to express themselves. And I think that to me is uh, just another just another idea and another conversation waiting to, to happen. Absolutely. And uh, um, do you, um, and I'm curious to know, uh, is your program model after like the El Sistema USA model or is it mostly like something that you've like really 
uh, talk to your colleagues about and you want to make it some make it something different because I know that El Sistema is more like for the Latin X community or is so what have you modeled like any specific program to help out with the uh, with heartbeat music project yeah I mean we we all have immense respect for El Sistema and it's it's I think a model for every music education program in the country you know um, regardless of what community is is being served um our program is modeled differently um and and I actually don't personally do a lot of the curricular design our executive director Sharon Nelson who is a uh Diné cultural knowledge holder and Diné language specialist um She's like become like like a an auntie of mine. She's just absolutely amazing. Um, one of the most like just deeply special people I've ever gotten to meet. She basically like has come in and um, you know she just has this vision that's so powerful. And um, you know a lot of it is modeled in traditional uh, indigenous Diné ways of learning. So that's kind of our main, our main centerpiece. And we do have a large cultural education component, which just, it's probably implied, but I'm going to just say this. I have no hand in that. I just sit in the back of the room, like completely amazed and inspired at what Sharon does and the people she brings in to, to work with the kids and to um, engage with them. And like, it's the kind of thing where when Sharon starts start speaking, the room goes silent and everyone, you know, ages five to, you know, I'm 24, like everyone is just completely like dumbfounded by, by how brilliant and how wonderful she is. So I would say we, we get a lot of different influences and, and there are so many programs that we have drawn influence from. We're very young. Like we've only been around for four years, which is, um, kind of kind of crazy and most of our staff except for for Sharon is, is in their early to mid 20s uh, which is also really a really interesting generational mix um, so yeah I mean we're still evolving so much we we have so many dreams organizationally so many things that we want to see happen um, you know I would I would love to at some point just like be able to to really get into a backseat role to just uplift um, indigenous and in particular Diné musicians to, to really spearhead this work and, and just kind of, you know, get whatever resources I can together to make it happen. Like, I, I feel like that's really what I'm called to do in this space. Um, and, and, you know, Sharon is really the, the heart and the soul of, of what we do. And, and I, I just try to like, I'm the can do girl. Like if Sharon dreams of something, she was like, we're going to bring all the kids to New York. We're going to, we're going to, they're going to play in Carnegie. And I was like, okay, um, it hasn't happened yet, but like, we're going to make it happen. Like, you know, things like that, where it's just, you know, everything that seems impossible with our tiny budget. And you know, we only have three people, myself and Sharon and one other colleague of mine included who work year round for heartbeat. Um, but we just like, we just make it happen. Um, and it's, that's awesome. Know, I love that. Like the little engine that could it's it's amazing and now that you know like last year heartbeat has gotten all this recognition and i'm like ah it's just like me writing grants in my room at 3 a.m <laughs> yeah but well, real talk though <laughs> real talk that's it's crazy those, those those grant writing um like i remember during my master's like whenever whatever chance i got in terms of like practicing how to write grants and knowing how to search for grants that's super valuable especially for a nonprofit. but i I want to just mention that you're providing such a high quality music program because of your experience at Juilliard. And I also um, read that you also, are you a current student at Yale or did you graduate from Yale? Recent graduate. I graduated last, last spring. So um, recent graduate. Okay. So, but either, either way, I mean, two very well known music schools in the world. And um, I kind of want to talk about that uh, for a moment and your experiences in those institutions. Like, you know, you spent four years at Juilliard and then two years at Yale. Um, talk, talk about your experience. Talk about, talk, talk about your experience um, being a, a student of Isaac Perlman because we also had another, um, another violinist. His name is Max Tan, as I'm sure you might, you might know Max. Yeah, Max. 
Yeah. And uh, we also had Timothy Chui on the on the oh, violin yeah. podcast too. So you know they all know who Itzhak Perlman is, <laughs> right? Sure. And I oh, hope one and I hope one day that I get to you know meet him in person. I haven't done that yet. But talk to me about like what it was like taking lessons with him and also taking lessons with Ms. Kavafian at Yale. Tell tell us about that. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. Okay. So. A lot of people who study with with Mr. P um, attended the Perlman Music Program as kids, um, and I did not. I actually, um, I don't know if I've like ever told this story publicly. This is so funny. Okay, so so this is a violin I, podcast exclusive. Yeah, exclusive. We're gonna break the internet, Ariel. <laughs> well, I started studying with Mr. P, which like is, um, well. We'll we'll get we'll get to that. So I actually my senior year of high school, I sent a tape in to audition for PMP and I was rejected. Um, and like, you know, in music, you get rejected from stuff all the time. Like I've heard no so many more times than I've ever heard yes. And like we don't talk about that because Instagram is just like a highlights reel and no one ever posts like, oh, thrilled to announce that I was rejected from Verbier today. Right. Uh, yeah. Which by the way has happened to me before. <laughs> so yeah, no, same. Like I it's just, you know, so I got rejected from PMP. Mrs. P wrote me a really sweet note. Um, on the rejection letter and she's like dear Ariel like we really enjoyed your audition tape like please consider applying next year I was like oh that's really nice you know I was I was bummed for a bit and then I moved on as you have to as you do Um, so I was auditioning for Juilliard Um, you know kind of like I was like oh I should just audition like I'm never gonna get in you know whatever Uh, I didn't even put like a teacher preference down I just was like I'll just take the audition because I was you know already in the area, my pre-college group, the Violin Virtuosi uh, of Indiana University, uh, was playing at Carnegie that week. And I was like, I'll already be in New York. Like, I might as well take the Juilliard audition. It's around the same time. Um, So Mr. P was not at my audition. Like, literally was not at my audition, nor was my other teacher, Catherine Cho. She wasn't there either. I just went and I played and it was fine. It wasn't great. It was okay. Um, you know, and then la di da, a few months later on April 1st, I get a call from the head of admissions at Juilliard and she was like, um, hey, like you are in and Mr. Perlman wants to have you in his studio. And it was April 1st. So I was like, haha, that's funny. Like, well, good, yeah, like good, good joke. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, like spill the tea. Like, yeah, let's, let's like, <laughs> all right, whatever. Like, that's really funny. She's like, no, I, I swear. Like, I'm dead serious Ariel like like you are you are in to study with Mr. Pullman if you'd like and literally that whole summer I was like this is a mistake like I don't I don't know him he's been my childhood hero forever like I never have gone to PMP he's never heard me play except for my failed PMP (laughs) audition tape Um, and I got there and it was actually only in my, I think, second or third year at Juilliard that I realized that actually that tape that I sent in, like, inspired him to take me at Juilliard. Like, he was like, oh, there's, you know, there's not room for her this summer, but I see she's auditioning at Juilliard. I'll just take her into my college studio. So it's so funny because that taught me that, like, sometimes a rejection is really just, like, it doesn't mean no. It just means, like, not right now or not for this thing. Um, and, I, lo- you know. I love that, that you said that yeah. because that's Absolutely. like, because that's to me, you know, I teach my students the same thing just because you get a rejection or just because something is hard doesn't mean that like you are a failure all the time, you know, Absolutely. it just, it's like, it's just a small percentage of your life that where you're like, okay, it's not, even though you failed, that's a, still a learning experience, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And you never know what what those things are gonna you know lead to in the future and and my four years studying with mr p we're we're just the best he's amazing he's so um for how famous he is he really could get away with being a jerk of a person you know he's just the the best person he's so kind he's so generous so selfless um he's just an exemplary human being and obviously i mean everyone knows how incredible of a musician he is. So, you know. Yeah, you don't, yeah, there's you know, no introduction needed. Yeah, like right, he's. Right, but like this man, even when no one's watching, is just 
such an incredible human being. And, and that, um, and, and so is Mrs. Perlman. They're both just two of the most special human beings to, to be on the planet right now. Um, you know, all musical things aside. And I did eventually go to PMP and I was one of the older students and I was really nervous that I wouldn't fit in. I was like, Oh, everyone's known each other since they were 12. And I'm just like coming here. And the, the environment that she cultivates at PMP um, is so welcoming and it's, you know, everyone is family and that's, you know, now I, I run a summer program <laughs> and that, you know, I try to, I try to be the Mrs. P of the heartbeat music project, which is so, um, I feel like I got the best possible like summer program leader training from her. Um, yeah, I can imagine so, what the leadership training must have been from her. That oh must have been God. incredible. Just even to observe, you know, how she, how she includes everybody. Like it, we would sing in chorus every day and like everyone sang together, like students, teachers, um, sometimes even like the kitchen staff would come sing with us, like just staff ever, like, you know, the lady f who does PMP's development would come, you know, and it was just like things like that where, um, it just, it really shaped me, even though I really, I was not a member of the PMP community for all that long as a kid. I mean, I've, you know, continued, of course, now as I've gotten older, but it was so impactful for me. And like, yeah, I, I took those lessons into grad school. Ani um, is like, like my third mom. I have two moms already, but she's my third <laughs> mom. Um, and all their names start with A. It's great. Um, Ani, Triple A. Like, literally, yeah. That's I mean, amazing. <laughs> Ani is, she is one of like, she's just my, my heart. And, and so is Catherine Cho, my other, my other teacher at Juilliard. She is just like, she also taught, uh, taught Timmy as well. We didn't intersect in the studio at the same time, but I just, I feel like, you know, and it, it, it's worth being said that I had incredible teachers growing up as a kid too. I studied with Mimi Swag and with Mauricio Fuchs and, and these people like, I feel like that's why I'm so drawn to teaching is because I just, I had the best teachers that you could ever want and not just musically, but like people who really, really care about um, the type of person you are, you know, who don't just value like technique or, you know, musicianship, but who really um, believe in the power of community for music. And, and I feel like that has influenced me uh, really, really profoundly and, and, not a day goes by when I don't think about all of them and, you know, how, how impactful they were. That's incredible. I hear the passion in your voice, too, just talking about these experiences and uh, makes me like, I want to go to PMP now. So yeah. that's, that's a like, little, little go, good little ad in there that you, <laughs> you slipped in. Um, no, I, I, I totally resonate with what you're saying because uh, like you, I've also had great mentors and teachers in my life, and I'm so lucky to have had those. Just gave me another reason to, to be inspired to teach, you know? And I've also felt that, uh, it's just like one way to give back, you know, I can, you know, you can do as much performing around the world and there's no problem in doing that. Right. I just, for me personally, is like, I feel like I can reach audiences by ed through education and, and, and through this podcast per se, through my students, you know, I have like, you, you know, like it gives me joy to have these kids hold their first violin, you know, like, yeah. have you ever had that feeling? Like when, you know, um, there's a like, total music teacher nerd right now, but like, you know, like the first time there's like, like a 132nd violin or whatever, it's like practically a toy. It's like made out of plastic instead of wood. It's like, you know, like it's, you yeah, have, um, it, it, yeah. it, it will sound horrible, but the, but the image, it's that. like, like, oh, yeah. I just want you to be the best person you can be outside of violin also. And, uh, yeah, man, I, I, I love teaching. I'm, I, I love teaching, but I also love performing. And I know that you also, um, a recent winner in the Concert Artist Guild um, pro, like competition. So again, congratulations to that. And I do want to talk about that because that has given you so much exposure to all your projects that you're doing, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you yeah. are a, a very gifted violinist. I've seen your, your, uh, your duos on Instagram and they're fabulous. They're really nice. Um, talk to me about the, about the process of the concert art guild and like how, like to the moment you sent the, the tape in to the moment where you got the acceptance letter, like, wait, is this happening? Uh, well, okay. So this is another one where like, I feel like I have to be just totally transparent 
this year was my fifth time trying out for Concert Artist Guild. Like, oh. I tried four times. I My first ever CAG audition was in 2016. I learned about them in college and CAG is so amazing. Um, you know, and now that I'm like a part of CAG, I, I see even more how much they care about um, you know, classical music as an entity and their artists as like real ambassadors for the field, you know, and, and um, as people who are going to, who are going to change the field and, you know, support all of these values that we were, we were talking about. Um, so I auditioned for the first time in 2016. That was a mess of an audition. Oh, it's really embarrassing to think about. Ha! Um, but yeah, I, I tried out every year. And after that, I was in the semifinals like every year including last year even. And this year, you know, COVID hit. Um, all of us lost so much work, um, so many performances and, you know, the, the world that's, you know, I say that as if that's like, you know, the worst thing that happened. That's really not. I mean, the world has been just in, in such a horrible place because of this and, you know, the, the mismanagement of, of how, we as a country have dealt with this virus has has devastated families and, and communities. And it's really, you know, the arts are one tiny little droplet of that. And I don't I don't mean to, you know, presume that the arts are the only thing that's been affected, but artists have definitely been affected during this time. And, you know, I was um, I just kind of like saw the application come in. I saw it was all virtual and I was like, what the heck? I'll try one more time. Like. You know, I really love CAG. I love everything they're about. Like I could really, not in like a cocky way, but I was like, you know, like they share the same values that I do. Like it was more of a values thing rather than like, I mean, I'm, you know, there are people who were in this competition this year who play a lot better than I do. That's for sure. Um, you know, I would never presume to uh, like say that, you know, I'm like a great violinist or anything. I mean, I work hard and I sound okay, but like, you know, it was more of just like a values thing for, for me. I was like, gosh, I'm going to just try one more time. So I made all of these recordings um, like in a bedroom <laughs> where I was staying with my boyfriend's family. Um, and like my boyfriend's brother like lent me this mic that he uses. And like I borrowed a ring light from someone because the lighting in the bedroom was way too dark. Um, and I just was like, you know, I'll just like, I'll record stuff that I'm into. Like, I'm not going to try to impress. I'm not going to try to like record what I think anyone would want me to record. Like, I'm just going to do what I'm about. And um, yeah, I, I got this uh, email back in, oh gosh, was it like late August? And um, I said, you know, we're starting this new ambassador prize thing. Like, would you, would you like to interview for it? Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, absolutely. So I had my interview on September 3rd and I was so unbelievably nervous, like hands were shaking, like the Zoom call open and it was like all of the CAG, like people. Palms are and, sweating. Ah, like you know? Tanya was there and Chris Williams and Tim Marr and Daniel and like all these. Oh anybody God. who's anybody was there. <laughs> I was terrified. They were like, tell us about the Heartbeat Music Project. And I was like, I hang with kids. <laughs> it's fun. I was awesome. so nervous. And like, I was trying to like, and I just kept on like, oh, just be yourself. Just be yourself. Like, if it doesn't work out, it's fine. So I actually found out along with everybody else. Like, I didn't get an email. There was a live stream announcement on Facebook. And I was just kind of like, okay, like, you know, just. I was, I was like so sick to my stomach, especially having to wait that long because my interview was on September 3rd and I only found out October 13th, which like in waiting time. It's like months. Long, yeah, that's a long time to wait. Yeah. To hear about. I was so like, yeah, I was just, you know, I was like almost sick to my stomach. And then all of a sudden they're like talking about, you know, all the finalists. And then like, they're like, we have another person we want to talk about. It's Arielle Horowitz. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh. Um, and then they announced it. I just like started bawling. I like wow. took a selfie to send to my boyfriend. I am the ugliest crier ever. <laughs> the history of like ugly criers. But I'm so glad I did because it like was such a candid reaction of just like, wow, I tried for this thing for five years because I like, I'm so about what CAG does and like I believe so much in the work they do with their artists and just in the classical music 
community that like it's I'm still pinching myself I can't believe it like it's so wild like I don't know I mean I I have to like calm down and you know start thinking about like what projects I want to do and stuff but like I'm still like it's just wild that, well tell that, me well tell me, tell me let me tell you this it's perseverance i mean five years that is it's exactly what i preach you know it's not going to happen on the first try no. you know? and i think i think that's the the disadvantage of social media these days you know it's become like about like oh check out what i'm doing that's like i'm successful but mo- you know let's but let's face it like 95 percent of the time it's about like all the failures you know and people are afraid to document the failures because as classical musicians, we sometimes attach, I don't know about you, but at least for me, I've discovered that when I was growing up, I've always attached like the criticism that a teacher gives me to my own personality and to my own, right? Yeah. You're, you're yeah. You're raising oh, yeah. your hand preaching. Yeah. Right. So I, I think the moment you kind of detach yourself, like the criticism that you're getting as a musician is not to direct it to you as a person, then the entire world changes for you. You know, the way you approach your instrument changes the, the moment you just detach yourself. And I think what you're saying, five years, you know, that, that enough said, yeah. <laughs> enough said. And um, I'm sure a lot of, you know, what Itzhak Perlman talks about, you know, who you, call, you refer to as Mr. P. That's the first time I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, feel like, I feel like only the cool kids, only the cool kids and the students get oh, to call Mr. P. <laughs> but um but he he's always said that you know you become a better player through teaching. I've always believed that. And you're you're a current teacher at Mount Holyoke College, which is again not too far away from where I am in Western Mass. So Hi. tell me about some of the some of the students that you have. Of course, it's collegiate level. Um, what what do you talk about in your lessons? What are some of the things that you focus on? Are you like a technique guru? Are you more of like a bigger picture? Um, person, like in terms of sound, color, or are you kind of a combination of both? I know certain people have like certain areas of expertise. So I'm curious to know what yours is. Yeah, well, it's so interesting. Like, um, I'm not that much older than my college students, which I was really, really nervous about when I started teaching last year. And last year, it was even more, like I was 23. Yeah. Last year. So when I started my job, like, I had a senior who was 22, you know, and, and in a sense, Um, there's just a collegiality that comes from being so close in age. And, you know, I basically just kind of had to think to myself, like, you know, some of the students are going to like that. Some of them are not like that's, you know, I am how old I am. Like I can put on a blazer and a pair of heels and a, you know, dark shade of lipstick. It doesn't change anything. You're still the age you are. Yeah, exactly. And like, I can't, you know, I, I am so lucky. I've had teachers who are all have all lived incredible life experiences, um, you know, from my my first teachers, um, you know, especially in Bloomington, Mauricio Fuchs is is one of the actually uh, yesterday was his 80th birthday. I was just on a Zoom call with like our whole student. That's right. So, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I heard that, too. Yeah, that's a huge accomplishment. Yeah, it's it's amazing, and and the you know we were on a Zoom call just earlier today, and and there were students that he taught in the '80s before I was born. You know, I mean his his legacy as a pedagogue is so transformative. I mean, like so many incredible violinists have have come out of his studio in Bloomington, and same with Mimi Swag. And there's a lot of technique that you know happens in in these spaces, and also so much like life experience that happens and you know even going through all the way up through grad school all of my teachers are just these really incredible well-rounded human beings with a lot to offer and you know me as someone now in my mid-20s I'm just like you know I I certainly have a unique life experience but there's no way that I can um you know live up to these guys that I studied with so I think for me you know it really depends on the student um I'm, I'm never going to be, I mean, hopefully someday I will become a wizened old teacher, but right now in, in this current incarnation of who I am, like I'm 24, I have the life experience I have. I'm never going to, you know, be able to emulate like something that a 65 year old could do because that's just, I haven't lived those 40 years. But what's so interesting at Holyoke is that I have such a mix of students. Like I have a student this semester who just started playing the violin, who she's just like a total rock star. Like she's 
breezing through Suzuki book one, like it's no one's business. And she's like so invested and is always like listening to recordings. And like, I heard this amazing piece called Introduction and Rondo Capriccioso. Do you know that one? I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> like, of course. Of course. <laughs> but like, you know, it's so cool that she's like discovering all of this for the first time. And like, it's hard to start an instrument as an adult. Whereas like, I also, I have a couple music majors who are really advanced and like, you know, I, we're working on Barber Concerto and, you know, like serious reps. So it's it's really great because I feel like I I have developed over this past year and some change now this ability to like really engage with each student for what they want out of their lessons. You know, a lot of students take lessons at Holyoke because they love music and and because they want to improve and they just want to enjoy music and um, you know, of course I will always push technique. Like I think that technique um, technique is the gateway to, you know, it's the tools in your toolbox and, and the better technique you have, the more you're going to enjoy your own playing. So at every stage of the game, we're always talking about setup. We're always talking about posture. Also injury prevention is something I'm really passionate about. So that's same here. Yeah. Conversation from day one. Like if it hurts, stop, you know, it's not, we don't believe in uh, no pain, no gain here in, in violin playing because you don't want to get a nerve injury. Like you don't want to mess with that. You have two hands and you know, that's, that's all you get. So um, pretty much what I like to say is if you get yeah. pain then game over. <laughs> yeah, really. yeah. I mean, and then you have to, I mean, I've had some injuries before and it's absolutely debilitating. It's really, um, you know, it's just whatever level of musician you are, like it, it's devastating to, to have that injury happen if, if it does. And sometimes it's unavoidable because, you know, you know, it's not always the, the player's fault. Sometimes your body just doesn't cooperate. But um, yeah, with my more advanced students, it's, you know, it's kind of a mix of, of technique, of building rep, of, of sound. I feel like what's also special actually is that I really embraced my age, which was something that I was really insecure about going in. Um, you know, like it was, it was really sweet. I, I have a student and yesterday she was just saying like, I, can I just say like, I really love having a young teacher. Cause I feel like you just like get me, you know, like, I feel like you get where I'm at in life and like, you get how stressful it is to be in college. And I was just like, I'm gonna cry. Like, that's so nice. Aww. Um, and yeah, there you you know, y'all. <laughs> oh, well, it's great. You know, like, and cause a lot of the time when you're dealing with someone a lot older than you, there's a certain um, degree of intimidation just inherently you know? yeah yeah I, I i think i i i resonate with you on that i agree with you yeah. i think like if you have like a teacher that's like 20 30 years older than you then of course there's like that you know like the teachers are put on a pedestal because like they are the violin masters they are the gods right they and um, as, as they should be you know they earn their right they earn, they earn their place in the violin world of course but you know i think that I think I would say that, you know, your age plays a huge advantage to you because again, you are, you're also able to relate, but not to mention you are able to just, you know, connect them. Like you are like in the same generation. I'm like, oh, these, I'm struggling with these things too, as a person, let's talk about it and let's maybe connect through music that way. So. Right. And it's, it's great because I mean, you know, the, the connections that I've been able to have with my student. I mean, of course, you know, I, I am the teacher and they are the student and that boundary is always intact. I really believe that that's important. But on a certain level, like I've had such interesting conversations with some of my students, especially my non-music majors, like they have the same professional fears that we do. You know, they're, every field is hurting right now. It's a really, really scary time to be in college. Um, so yeah. it's hard, you know, and, and, a lot of times older people, you know, they're going through this pandemic at a much later stage of life where it's like, oh, like it's going to be okay. But for, for us, we're so young and, you know, you never get to have your 20s again. Like it's such a special time and um, we're all going to be so severely impacted by this, by this year. And it's, it's scary. Right. I think overall, I think creativity, whoever is the most creative is going to change the world, I think. Um, and um speaking of creativity i want to i want to ask how you practice because we just talked about how you teach but if yeah. you were to give one really important tip to the violinists who are listening here today what would that tip be from ariel horowitz what, mm. what would that tip be 
Okay, well, this is actually a tip from Mauricio Fuchs. I can't really take credit for this one, but especially- That'll be I fine. You won't be penalized. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So credits go to Maestro Fuchs, who just turned 80, and he is a lot smarter than I am, as has so many more years of experience as a teacher. Um, but, you know, what's so interesting is he would always say, like, you are your own best teacher. Um, and, and it was such an empowering message for me as a young girl growing up um, because it, it made me take responsibility for what happened during my practicing in a different way. Um, you know, it, and now that I teach, there's only so much the teacher can give you, you know, like the best educators provide you with the opportunity to learn, to teach yourself. And, and you know, that also I hope is really empowering because, you know, we are the experts on ourselves. You know, I, if you study with me, I can never tell you how it feels inside of your body to be playing the violin or inside of your mind. You know, I, I can tell you what I see. I can tell you what I observe, but I think, you know, truly great practicing is just really the art of, of falling in love with your sound and falling in love with your approach to music and, and your, belief in, in what you want to do. Because I mean, let's face it, a lot of the time classical music can feel like a museum art form. You know, we go and we admire these great works in, in kind of a passive lens. But the reason that I believe that classical music is, is still important is that we still have so much to say. And how impactful is it that like, you know, a piece by Brahms is played in 2020. Brahms, if he was woken up out of the grave and brought into 2020, he would be shocked by the world. You know, he would you'd be like, wow. I mean, amazed and also probably pretty sad in a lot of ways too. But it's it's this- um, They'd probably go to the pub and drink more beer, honestly. Right? Yeah. I mean, same though. Like mm, 2020 is not fun for anyone. But um, yeah, I mean, I think the best practicing happens. I mean, of course, you know, listen to your teachers, do what they tell you to do, but- when you can correct yourself and when you can teach yourself and, and not only hear your teacher's voice in your head, but hear your own voice in your head, I think that's when um, really, really beautiful discoveries and, and practicing and, and learning and enjoying happens in, in our art form. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that advice because I also teach that too. And in my, in my young students is, you know, when I'm not around, you know, you are responsible for how you sound, you are responsible for how you practice, you know. Yeah. And of course, you know, I, I happen to teach younger students, I do have a couple advanced students at like upper middle school about to go into high school. But a lot of them, I mean, I still have to teach like one directional, you know, like, okay, I'm the teacher, I have to teach you this is how to this is how to do it. Eventually, yeah. though, there comes a transition point where like, okay, well now it's about learning how to be most effective while you're in the practice room, while I'm not around. And th these are the techniques that I've used throughout the years. And it seems like you do that also. Ariel, it's been such a blast talking to you. It's so nice to meet you. Where can people get a hold of you? Where can people uh, get in touch with you if they have any questions or, and um, have any just general questions about the violin? You know, yeah. where, can they, where can people get in touch with you? Awesome. Well, okay, there are a few options. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. It's at Ariel Horowitz Violin. Really original handle. I know I'm so creative. Um, <laughs> I'm really, my like fatal flaw is that I'm super slow at responding to DMs, but I will respond to you if you message me. Like, mm. it may take a minute, but I, I promise. And like, if I don't respond fast enough, just like keep keep DMing me. <laughs> I'm really slow, but, but I, I will, I will get back to you. Um, you can also follow the heartbeat music project on Instagram and on Facebook. Um, you can also follow me on Facebook and send me a Facebook message to my artist page and you can, uh, find me and message me on my website. It's arielhorowitz.com. Um, Ariel spelled not the French way, A-R-I-E-L. Um, I once had someone be like, I tried to search for you at R-E-R-E-A-R-I-E-L-L-E -E 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 Horowitz. And I was like, no, that's not me. That's a different girl. She's really cool too, but probably <laughs> ask her about the violin. I don't know if she knows. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. of course, I'm going to put all those links in the podcast description notes. So make sure to click on those links to get to know Ariel if, you're, if you haven't done so already. Um, Ariel? wonderful to meet you. I get to, I hope I get to meet you in person in Western Mass and we get to play yes, some chamber music. Definitely. That'll be amazing. Right, let's do it. 
Wonderful. Okay. Well, anyways, thank you so much for everyone who's listening to the Violin Podcast. We really appreciate it. If you haven't done so already, please make sure to hit the subscribe button because it helps us a lot as a podcast to provide more episodes for you. And also, if you haven't taken a look at our Patreon page, you can subscribe with limited content for $2 a month. It's less than a cup of coffee. So make sure you do that. And again, we really appreciate you coming out and listening to the Violin Podcast. Thanks so much. And we will be in your ears in a couple of weeks. Take care now. Thank you.